Uh, Michael A. Ahern is a distinguished university professor emeritus in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Maryland, where he has been as a faculty since completing his PhD at the University of Wisconsin over 45 years ago. Starting as a ground-based observer, he has studied comets and asteroids for most of his career. He gradually uh, made the transition to using uh, space-based observatories, particularly the International Ultraviolet Experiment, Explorer rather, and subsequently the Hubble Space Telescope, among others. He has participated in nearly all robotic missions uh, to comets, either as a team member or as a principal investigator. He is also the principal investigator for the Small Bodies Node of NASA's Planetary Data System, which archives all NASA's funded data relevant to comets, asteroids, and planetary dust. Professor Ahern, Professor Ahern's significant scientific achievements, of course, revolve around comets, as one would expect, and include, among others, the first major survey of the abundance of volatile compounds and, and uh, the discovery of unexpected molecules in comets, the direct measurement of the densities of the nuclei of comets, of comets, and the first physical and chemical evidence of migration of the giant planets in, their near, in the early stages of formation of our solar system. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Ahern to deliver his lecture on smaller bodies of the solar system, comets, asteroids, TNOs, and what they tell us about our planetary system, how planetary systems are formed. Professor Ahern. Okay, well, let's, all right, <laughs> if I speak loudly, I used to be able to project to a classroom much larger than this. Um, <clears throat> I have been promised that there will be very many questions, and therefore I have set for myself a personal new record in the fewest slides per minute. I'm down to two-thirds of a slide per minute on this talk. I'm usually up at two. <laughs> um, so I expect questions, at least as long as they're relevant to what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was interested to listen to the, uh, the minutes about John Logsdon's talk here a few weeks ago, uh, because I have many memories of interacting with the Soviets when they were still part of the Soviet Union, uh, but those are rather peripheral, although they were, were in connection with observing Comet Halley. Uh, they were rather peripheral to what I wanted to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about a variety of things. I've cut out most of the details on the assumption that you'll ask me about the details you care about. Um, <clears throat> So let me start out by asking, why do we want to study the small bodies? And by small bodies, I mean more or less anything other than the eight planets. Um, so some of them, in particular bright comets, are the single most spectacular thing you'll ever see in the nighttime sky. In, a, in the daytime sky, a total solar eclipse is far more impressive. But in the nighttime sky, a bright comet is the most impressive thing you'll ever see. Small bodies, both comets and asteroids, hit the Earth. It's, relatively speaking, easy to get to some near-Earth objects, easier than to get even to the Moon, at least if you want to come back. Getting to the Moon is trivial. Getting back from the Moon is not so easy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk about mining asteroids. A company has just been formed um, a month or so, a month or two ago, to invest in mining asteroids for resources. They can be valuable resources. The reason I, as an astronomer, want to study the small bodies is because the small ones preserve the best record of what went on four and a half billion years ago when the, when the planets were forming. The planets have destroyed all the chemical evidence because they're hot inside and the chemical reactions have changed all the chemistry inside the planets. So those are the reasons. I'll, I'll hit some of them in a little more detail. The planets are also made up of small bodies. It is thought that Jupiter 
has a core ten times the mass of the Earth that is basically all comets. The Earth is made up of small bodies that basically are asteroids. Now, it's been processed a lot in the last four and a half billion years, but it's the small bodies that produce the planets. Okay, and that's the real reason for wanting to study them. So here are a couple examples of the spectacular nature of comets. They are so spectacular that there is a lore about them going back several millennia as omens of things happening on Earth. Uh, there was a uh, Jewish Roman historian called Josephus who wrote a history of things going on at that time. And this is actually a woodcut from the Middle Ages reprint of Joseph, Josephus's history showing Comet Halley hanging like a dagger over the city of Jerusalem for several weeks immediately prior to the time that Titus, who was then only a general, no, not yet the, uh, the Roman emperor, uh, before he sacked the city of Jerusalem. It goes way back. Here's a comet which was originally attributed to being Comet Halley, but maybe a much brighter comet that happened later, in the Scrovegni Chapel in Padova, Italy, painted by Giotto di Bondone in the uh, 1300s. That's the first representation, probably, of a comet as the star of Bethlehem. Uh, I'm sure the Latin scholars in the audience will recognize Isti Mirant Stella, they wonder at the star. That is known to be Comet Halley. This is a tapestry from a cathedral in Bayeux, France. And I trust everyone would know why a tapestry in Bayeux, France might have something to do with Comet Halley. That was immediately, Bayeux was the home of William the Conqueror. And uh, that's actually King Harold with his astrologers telling him to worry about this comet shortly before uh, 1066 when the Normans invaded. You know, so it's a great omen if you're a Norman. It's a pretty awful omen if you're a Saxon. Uh, <clears throat> so the point is they are spectacular. Uh, that is a picture of Comet Hale-Bopp uh, from 15 years ago, just taken with a 35 millimeter camera of when I was out in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, obvious naked eye object. Most impressive comet I ever saw as a naked eye object went seen from Beltsville, just outside the Beltway at the Goddard Optical Site. It was Comet West in 1977 going from the horizon up that high. Okay, 45 degrees across the sky. They really are spectacular once every 10 years or so, not very often. All right, so that's some motivation. Uh, a random example of uh, Comet Hale-Bopp being cited as an omen of war by the Taliban from a newspaper article from 1996. Okay, comets also impact the Earth. <laughs> the impact hazard is not a very big hazard. You know, you're far more likely to die, you're orders of magnitude more likely to die in an automobile accident. You're even more likely to die in an airplane accident than die from being hit by an asteroid. The one fundamental difference about the asteroid impacts, and, and this includes comets. comets. Comets are the big ones. Asteroids are the small ones. The, the dinosaur killer probably was a comet. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that's different about this hazard compared to all the others, like earthquakes, which are far more important in terms of both property damage and killing people, is that we know, in principle at least, how to prevent the event from happening. Earthquakes, we can't even forecast them reliably. These we can forecast, and we know in principle how to divert them so they don't hit the Earth. That's a fundamental difference in what you believe on how much we should invest in insurance, in preventing something rather than repairing it after it's destroyed, would affect how you decide to fund these mitigation studies. So why are they important for 
human exploration or for mining exploitation, either one. This just gives you how much velocity you need to get places. Uh, to get from Earth to low Earth orbit, orbit of Hubble Space Telescope, for example, communication satellites are actually up higher, they need more. Uh, but anything in low Earth orbit, eight kilometers per second. That's pretty fast. You, and if you've got a lot of mass, it's hard to get it up there. Getting to an NEA requires, in addition to this, from low Earth orbit, another five and a half. Getting to the surface of the moon is actually harder. Six and a half. Getting to one of the moons of Mars, Phobos or Deimos, requires eight. Getting to the surface of Mars requires more because you need lots of delta V to slow yourself down so you don't kill everybody on board and destroy your entire spacecraft. Coming back is where the big difference is, however. To get off of Mars from the surface, you need another five kilometers per second. From moon, you need two. From a near-Earth asteroid, you need you know, a few meters per second instead of kilometers per second. You don't have to carry a huge rocket with lots of fuel to get back. Okay? And that's the fundamental difference, and that is one of the key reasons why um, asteroids are considered feasible targets for human exploration and for mining. Okay? Well, if you want to mine them in situ, you don't need, again, a big rocket to bring back what you've mined. Most ideas on mining actually involve bringing it back near the Earth uh, and mining it in Earth orbit, and then just dropping down to Earth the things you need. Uh, so why would you want to explore them? Well, human exploration in space inspires most of the country, without a doubt. Um, those of us in the science community keep insisting that, yes, humans can do better science if they go places, but it costs so much more that you can do more with robot robotic missions. Uh, and therefore, most of us work primarily with robotic missions uh, to get around the solar system. But if we could get a man there for other reasons, uh, the whole exploration thing, the whole thing about Kennedy beating the Russians to the moon, Okay, uh, then uh, <coughs> the landing on the NEO is easy. Whoops, back up, that one. Uh, you're not landing on something, you're rendezvousing with it, just like we rendezvous with the space station, just because there's no local gravity, it's, or it's negligible. When you want to come back, you just push off. You don't need a big rocket to get away. For science, the real advantage of a human is that of all the environments where we talk about sending astronauts, the one we least understand is asteroids and comets, near-Earth objects. Humans are more adaptable than robotics, without a doubt. And that's where humans have a big advantage. They can figure out what to do when they are confronted with an unexpected environment and the environment will not, will be something other than what's expected. And this human adaptability is most useful for, for science. It's also useful for general operations in the vicinity of an NEO. So that's why you want to go there. It's easier and humans are more valuable there. Now, you know, staking your, putting your flag down and staking your territory on a body that's only two kilometers in diameter isn't quite as impressive as staking a claim to all of Mars, but nevertheless, it's what you can do practically. So why do we want to mine them? This has become a big question since this company was formed a few months ago to consider mining them. Most of the metals on Earth are actually down in the core. They're what we call iron-loving uh, materials or siderophile uh, elements. The bulk of them are down in the core. Uh, and what's in the near the surface where we can mine it is traces, much of which has been accumulated from impacts by comets and asteroids. 
Uh, <clears throat> so if you go to one of the comets or asteroids that's brought in all this stuff more recently to the Earth, you get a much higher percentage of all these valuable metals in particular. And that's true of most asteroids. Um, in fact, the whole discovery of the impact that caused the death of the dinosaurs was because there was a whole layer of iridium spread all over the world in a layer of about the right age 65 million years ago. And iridium is pretty rare on Earth, but it's relatively common in certain kinds of meteorites and therefore in certain kinds of asteroids. <coughs> um, if you go to a comet, the most valuable resource, whoops, sorry, is in fact water. Because you need hydrogen and oxygen to fuel things very efficiently. Because the recombination of hydrogen and oxygen to make water provides lots of energy. And you got a huge amount of water in comets, and not having to lift it the 11 kilometer per second escape velocity from Earth to escape, you can bring a, put a comet in near Earth, in low Earth orbit, generate your fuel there, where you only have a couple of kilometers per second more needed to escape. So it's much more efficient in the use of rockets. Uh, <clears throat> so those are sort of the reasons for mining. My own view is that the feasibility of any of this is several decades away. Okay? I personally am not ready to invest money. Now maybe if I were a billionaire, I might be ready to invest money, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think it will happen. I think it's likely to happen, just not very soon. And I applaud the people who are trying to do it. Uh, sure. A space elevator? That's still pretty much in the concept phase, not, not what I would call the real engineering phase. Yeah. There are lots of, well, I mean, mining these things in the first place is still what I view as the concept phase, not any engineering studies yet. Um, and the space elevators in that same category. Yeah. Uh, let's hold that question at the end, please. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll put, put All right. Hold your fire for the end. <laughs> Until I get my gun out and can fire back. <laughs> Uh, now, one of the real issues is that, in general, in the asteroids, we only know what's in the top hundredth of a millimeter. We know about the composition of asteroids from the reflectivity to light. In some cases, very nearby ones, reflectivity to radar waves, which penetrate a few centimeters, maybe 10 centimeters. That doesn't tell us what things are like beneath the surface. That is a key limitation in figuring out which asteroid you want to mine and what you're going after when you go there. It's. Uh, <coughs> whoops. Uh, so we only measure the surface properties and we have to, it's, a, it's an educated guess from there what's inside. Okay, so now let me talk about what drives me to study the small bodies. Uh, and I've studied primarily asteroids and com well, primarily comets, secondarily asteroids, not very, very much on trans-Neptunian objects. Small things preserve the chemistry of four and a half billion years ago. That's the whole reason for studying them. They don't have enough e internal heat to change the chemistry. You heat things up in the Earth due to radioactive decay, well, for initially due to the gravitational collapse, subsequently due to radioactive decay of uranium, thorium, and potassium-40. And that changes the chemistry. So the chemistry is completely changed. And understanding the chemistry of four and a half billion years ago lets you understand what was going on when the planets were forming. Because the planets formed out of these comets and asteroids. 
So, how small is small? <laughs> so, the recent definitions of what a planet is uh, are that there are eight planets, period, <laughs> in our solar system. If a body is big enough that gravity overcomes strength, the body will become spherical. So if the body is spherical, it's a dwarf planet, not a planet. Uh, there's a the long political history behind this. I was far too involved in it to discuss it without getting rather angry. <laughs> uh, and for typo, depending on what the material is, that's somewhere around 500 to 1,000 kilometers. So Pluto's a dwarf planet. The asteroid Ceres is a dwarf planet. Eris, which is a trans-Neptunian object, is a dwarf planet. They're, uh, they're this, this size or a little bigger. Um, <clears throat> so they don't preserve things. Those are changed. Something smaller, like Vesta, where the Dawn mission just went, that's clearly evolved a lot due to internal processing. It's not quite big enough that gravity overwhelms strength, so it's not very spherical. But it's between, it's maybe, it's, it's at the lower limit of this. Um, it basically does not count as a primitive body. By the time you get down to 100 kilometers, many of them have changed. When the solar system formed, there were these radioactive elements that came from nearby stars, nearby supernovae. The most important one is aluminum-26, which has a half-life of 10,000 years or something like that. There's none, none left, but we see it as magnesium-26. We see it as an excess of one particular kind of magnesium. Uh, those would have melted bodies bigger than 100 kilometers. Okay? So those are not primitive bodies. You probably need to get down to something like 10, maybe 20, maybe 40 kilometers, maybe 5 kilometers, to get what, what, what I would call truly primitive bodies. The ones that preserve all the chemistry from 4.5 billion years ago. But there are a lot of those out there, and that's why I, as a scientist, want to study them. So they probably do preserve the chemistry from four and a half billion years ago. Why does the, why does the chemistry four and a half billion years ago matter? Because what molecules you have around depends on the density and the pressure, as well as on the atomic abundances. But the atomic abundances were the same everywhere. Near the sun, the temperature was high. Further from the sun, it was cold. Um, <clears throat> so this tells you something about the conditions uh, under which the planets formed. So that's the real goal here in terms of the science. So let me talk a little bit about a couple of missions that I was involved in primarily. I won't talk much about Dawn. Uh, NASA, 20 years ago, uh, started a program in which missions were designed not by NASA centers, but by scientists. And these were the small missions called originally Discovery Class. And there have now been 13 or 14, something like that. And a scientist is in charge. And I was lucky enough to win twice <laughs> with uh, Deep Impact and Epoxy. So I'll talk a little bit about those. They're relatively narrow missions. Deep impact, and most of mine are focused on comets rather than asteroids, but I'll keep coming back to the question of asteroids. Question was, we see gas coming out of comets. That's the, def that's the empirical definition that separates a comet from an asteroid. If you see fuzz around it in a picture, it's a comet. If you don't see fuzz around it, it's an asteroid. That is the actual IAU definition. <laughs> just because it's an easy empirical criterion to sort things by early on when you worry about how you name things, how you catalog them, all that st sort of stuff. <coughs> um, but we will, all the theories said there are big differences in what the ices are inside the nucleus compared to what comes out from the surface. 
And the whole point of deep impact was to compare the inside and the outside. Send an impactor in, excavate material from 20, 30 meters deep, and see if it's the same composition as what's coming out spontaneously. I mean, we did a lot of other things, measuring other physical properties, but that was the gist of it. These are, so these are narrow missions that are very cheap by NASA standards. You know, if I had to pay for it out of my checkbook, it would not be cheap. But by NASA standards, it's cheap. So, here are movies taken during the Deep Impact mission. On the left, you see pictures from the impactor as it went in. The impactor was taking pictures, and that, that surface that we're going into is sloped about like this, as you saw it coming in on the impactor. And if you think of yourself as going around the sun, the comet's going around the sun, you're going around the sun as fast as you can, and the comet is coming down and hitting you on the top of the head at 10 kilometers per second. That's how you should think about this picture on the left. Whoa. Sorry. And you'll notice things... Oh, it stopped. I thought it was going to loop. Uh, <clears throat> so, you notice it bouncing around. That's the spacecraft trying to figure out where the target is. It had onboard targeting, and, you know, and it was trying to figure out where it was. Uh, fortunately, it did find out, and it hit. And what you see on the right is the flyby spacecraft watching what happened. And you see all that bouncing around. That impactor is a third of a ton. That bouncing around is dust particles hitting the front of the spacecraft, which are less than a milligram. About one ten-thousandth of an ounce. That 10 kilometer per second speed is really fast, and a tiny dust particle can really bounce a very heavy spacecraft around. Uh, okay, so you, all this material came out in this picture on the right, in this movie on the right. The remarkable result was that what came out in the ejecta was exactly the same as what came out from the ambient release of gases. That was not predicted by most theories. Most theories predicted there would be big differences. Uh, <clears throat> So what that says basically is comets lose a large fraction of, the, of their surface every time they go around the sun. Typically anywhere from 10 centimeters to a few meters of surface averaged over the surface every time they go around the sun. And that basically says that you're taking stuff away faster than the heat can penetrate below the surface. So you get a better physical understanding of what's going on there. It also showed that the material is very weak. Those comets are held together mostly by gravity. The nucleus is mostly empty. It's 75% empty space inside. Okay? Now, okay, we've done this experiment on one comet. We've never done it on an asteroid. We've never done it at any other location on any other comet. So we have no idea what's typical. But astronomers are used to arguing from statistics of one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that's the best we can do. Um, in 2015, we will launch a mission, OSIRIS-REx, which is going to an asteroid, and that'll do sampling. Unfortunately, that's not, not going to get down more than a couple of centimeters. Okay, it's not going to get deep enough to be really interesting. It'll give us lots of other information about the material. It is important, but it's not going to address this kind of question. Um, <coughs> the Ros European Rosetta mission will land on Comet triumov grasimenko in November 2014. That will drill down half a meter. Okay, again, not very deep. Get, getting deeper than OSIRIS-REx, uh, but not deep enough to be really informative of what's on average inside. This is the kind of knowledge you need before you can do mining or any kind of exploitation. It's the kind of 
experiment you need to know before you can properly interpret these things for understanding the science of how the solar system formed. This is a picture from Deep Impact, or a pair of pictures. Uh, this one was 45 minutes after the impact, and we were now had flown past it. The flyby spacecraft was going at 10 kilometers a second. It flew, back, flew by very quickly. Looking back, you see all the ejecta. And this is um, an hour and a quarter, I think, um, after the impact. And the ejecta is spreading laterally. If you have strong material on the, on the comet or asteroid, that ejecta just lifts up from the surface and dissipates. This lets us set an upper limit on the strength. And it's far weaker than, than crushed ice. Okay, it's much weaker than that by a couple orders of magnitude. Okay, and, and weaker than any reasonable rock. Even, or even a badly fractured rock. Uh, the fallback of that material back onto the surface lets us measure the gravity. So we can measure the mass of the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> when we impacted, we expected a very bright flash. Didn't happen. It was a very faint flash. We've done all these experiments at the NASA vertical gun range where you shoot particles at oh, up to about seven or eight kilometers per second into any target you want. And they show that if you get to get such a weak flash, the porosity of the top surface layer has to be at least 75%. And the mass of the nucleus says that the average density of the nucleus is less than half a gram per cc. Water, ice, has a density of one. Rocks vary from two to five. So clearly the interior, and, and there's some of both in the nucleus, clearly the interior of the nucleus is mostly empty space. Okay? That's an, that is an important result. These nuclei, they look really permanent like rocks. They're incredibly fragile. Not much holding them together. And it's a problem making them. Making things with that lower density due to bringing clumps together is non-trivial. It's possible, but non-trivial. Need, it needs more modeling than has ever been done. Uh, we have other evidence that other comets are weak. I mean, it's not just Comet Temple 1 where Deep Impact went. Here's Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 going into Jupiter back in 1993, I guess it was. Or no, I guess it was, the impact was 95. The comet was discovered in 93. Um, the gravity of Jupiter broke it up into a lot of pieces. That gravity says it's got to be low density and very weak. Okay? Uh, you know, there, there are strengths in, sheer strengths in physical units for the, for, for the two of you in the audience that recognize them. Uh, <coughs> there are comets that break up spontaneously. This is a comet from 1999 that was coming into the sun Big comet, looked very typical, all of a sudden it just blew apart. And two months later, there was nothing, the upper limit on any pieces was about 100 meters. It started out as a couple of kilometer object. And it just spontaneously broke apart. Now we don't know the mechanism, but assuming there aren't nuclear warheads embedded in the, uh, in the comet that are uh, being set off, uh, <clears throat> this implies that it's very weak. We just can't quantify it. Uh, we have lots of theories on what the mechanism is, but uh, none of them can be favored over another one at this point. The, the least unlikely one is probably when you make ice at very low temperatures, it's amorphous. When you make it at high temperatures, it's a crystal. And when you warm amorphous ice up, it crystallizes. And when it crystallizes, it releases a lot of energy. So that's the least unlikely explanation, that the comets had amorphous ice and it crystallized. Um, you, how many people went out to see the Perseids on August, August 12th, the Perseid meteor shower? 
two. <laughs> okay, it's the most reliable meteor shower. It's associated with Comet Swift Puddle. It's this material that was shed by Comet Swift Puddle on previous times around the sun. And the, the, the meteors from comets always burn up very high in the atmosphere, which says they're being slowed down very efficiently by very thin air, which says they're small and fragile and porous, basically. They need to be porous in order to explain the meteors that we see. <coughs> we have lots of other uh, measurements that show that the grains in comets are themselves fragile. Okay? So they're probably fragile at all scales, from kilometer scales down to sub-millimeter scales. When we want to understand the origin of comets, we've got to separate out things that change, things that are evolutionary. Here are pictures of Comet Temple 1 from five and a half years apart. Deep impact mission went to Comet Temple 1. Five and a half years later, the Stardust Next mission went to Comet Temple 1. We know just from counting the material that comes off that Comet Temple 1 loses about this much material averaged over all its surface every time it goes around the sun, about 30 centimeters, to within a factor of two or so. So we look at Comet Temple 1 and ask, what are the changes over five and a half years, one orbital period? And this was from Deep Impact, these two. Here was the picture of the comet, the whole nucleus, and this, this area is this area right in here. And you see, you look here, here's this big extension here, it's gone. This is from Stardust Next five and a half years later. That piece is gone. This, re this gap here has gotten larger. The ridges between these three depressions are all gone, everything's collapsed. Those features are all at the scale of 10 to 40 meters. So those are changes that are really big. They're the size of this room. Okay, so those are changes the size of this room. So the activity on comets is sporadic, at least spatially, and probably it's sporadic in time as well, although we don't have enough data to show that. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to be careful not to overinterpret what we see. So after deep impact, we went back to NASA and said, hey, we have a great idea to use the one spacecraft that still works. The impactor, of course, was mostly vaporized or melted and buried in Comet Temple 1. But the flyby spacecraft was still fine, so we asked NASA, will you give us enough money to fly it to another comet? So we went to a different comet, Comet uh, Hartley 2. Uh, the comets are named for their discoverers. And Hartley, too, means it's the second short period comet that Malcolm Hartley discovered. Uh, <clears throat> we actually did two things. Uh, the mission was called Epoxy, which was a combination of two other acronyms, <laughs> EPIC and Dixie, which were two, pro two independent proposals. The, the head, the head, I was the head of this one, and the head of EPIC was a fellow named Drake Deming at Goddard. He and I had sort of talked about this beforehand, to do this together, because we could get more money. We, we, we couldn't fit things under the NASA cap for how much money you could have. Uh, and <clears throat> it's sort of like a shotgun marriage when NASA said you have to put the two proposals together. Well, that's because the two principals had had certain interactions before uh, and anticipated this. I'm only going to talk about the Dixie part. Uh, it's a totally different kind of comet. So this is a movie taken as we flew by. All right, it looks like a bowling pin. It's the smallest nucleus we've ever seen, up close. But what you really want to notice is all these bright spots. All those bright spots, you know, you might think those are background stars, they're cosmic rays hitting your CCD detector. No, <laughs> they aren't. Those are, those, because they stay as spots and they move around, they have to be very close to the nucleus. They have to be within 50 kilometers of the nucleus. 
Those are ice chunks. Every one of those bright spots is an ice chunk. Here's another picture. You can see them going back and forth. A star, the spacecraft is turning so fast that a star would be trailed out by this much. Okay, so they're not stars. Those are chunks of ice. And the biggest ones are that big. And they're mostly fluffy, mostly empty space. Very fragile, fluffy structure of ice. That was completely unexpected. Ten years ago, we'd all been predicting we should find ice, crisp, ice chunks around comets. We never found them at Deep Space One going by Borelli. We didn't find them, well, we didn't find them at, back in the 80s with all of the missions that went to Comet Halley. We did not find them on the Stardust mission to Comet Vilt 2. We did not find them on the Deep Impact mission to Temple 1. So we all said, okay, they aren't there. But now we finally go to Hartley 2, and oh, lo and behold, they are there. Um, <clears throat> so here's a picture of the nucleus up close. And it turns out that this is all carbon dioxide gas, subsurface dry ice that's coming out in jets and dragging chunks of water ice out with it. Okay? Here, there's water coming out of this part, but no ice. And there's not much of anything coming out of the other end. There's a little bit coming out here, but that's all. So, this is a completely different kind of comet than the, any of the others we've been to. Every time we go to a comet, we are surprised. Uh, where is the sun in that picture? Pardon? Where is the sun? To the right. I've, I tr I've tried to make the sun to the right in all the pictures, but I can't promise I succeeded. <laughs> so Hartley 2 is one of these hyperactive comets. We do what I like to characterize as a spherical cow model of the nucleus. Basically, it's an oversimplified matter model that assumes the nucleus is a sphere, and it's dirty ice, and you ask, how, much, how fast does the water sublime? You know how big the nucleus is, and for most comets, you only need 10% of the surface to explain the water. For Hartley 2, you need 200% of the surface. Okay, well, that's a little problem. <laughs> and the whole point is that most of the surface is not in the nucleus, it's in all those icy grains that are outside, so you can produce water very f much more prolifically than otherwise. And there are half a dozen comets like Hartley, too. Why they're different, we don't know. Uh, <coughs> so, my speculation is that Comet Hartley 2 was originally a contact binary. Two different things that got brought together four and a half billion years ago. One's got more ice than the other. Because that's why you see a big difference between the two. And even as it rotates, you see the, when the big one gets close to the sun, it doesn't turn on nearly at all, basically. There are the five comets we've been to. Now, I defy you to find the similarities. You can find isolated pairs of similarities, but that's about it. You might say, gee, that one, Borelli, looks like the same shape as this one is Hartley too. This is a blow-up. These are all to the same scale. Okay? So this one is tiny compared to the others. And they do look sort of similar, but Hartley 2 is perfectly symmetric around its axis, almost perfectly. Borelli is bent. It's a banana. So, in fact, it really is very different, even though in that particular picture it looks rather similar in gross shape. All right. So, what can I say about where comets came from? And therefore, how do we use them to understand how the planets form? Uh, so I've already argued that the small bodies preserve the chemistry record. Asteroids, comets, trans-Neptunian objects, they, they were originally a continuum, forming at just successively lower temperatures as you went out in the solar system. In this early disk, when the planets formed, there was a lot of dust. The du when, when things condensed, they rapidly sink right to the middle. So you get a lot of dust, and you can't see the sun because there's so much dust in the way. 
So it gets cold very quickly. As soon as you get to the point where, ice, where water vapor can condense as ice, and that's maybe 180 Kelvin, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> depends on the density and pressure, but uh, it's that ballpark, 190 Kelvin. The, as soon as you get there, there's so much hydrogen and oxygen that there's a huge amount of water in this disk. And so this disk, which just from symmetry arguments has a gradually decreasing density, has a big sudden increase where the water condenses. That's where Jupiter formed, and that's why Jupiter formed first. Jupiter formed just outside the snow line where ice can condense. Okay? There's a snow line for water ice, there's a snow line for dry ice further out. Beyond that, there's one for carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide one is down at 30 or 40 degrees Kelvin, very cold. Uh, <coughs> so these snow lines are throughout the disk. But the other important thing to realize is that the comets did not happen, did not form where they are today. The planets have moved around a lot. This is a realization of the last 15 years. Uh, the first indications were maybe 20 years ago. So Jupiter forms from comets, then Saturn forms, eventually all the other planets form. Jupiter, Ur Saturn, Uranus, Neptune form from comets. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars form from asteroids. There's an asteroid belt where Jupiter kicked stuff out so fast that you couldn't form a planet. There was nothing, that you could never build up the density to form a planet because the gravity of Jupiter was too strong because there are strong resonances between the period of Jupiter around the sun and the, and the asteroid belt around the sun. So things get mixed up and can't coalesce there. But what we realize now is that first Jupiter and Saturn moved in. Then when they were in resonance with each other, that turned it around and they started moving out. So we realized for a long time that Neptune had to move out. Pluto is the prototype for a large number of trans-Neptunian objects called Plutinos, baby Plutos, who that are in the same orbit that's a resonance with Neptune. And those, it was realized 20 years ago, that those must have been captured when Neptune migrated outward and captured them in this resonance. Okay? So that's been known for 20 years. This motion inward was understood last year for the first time. And the inward and then the reversal to go back outwards, that was all just worked out last year. That mixes up all the asteroids, mixes up the comets with the asteroids to some extent. And <clears throat> it says that the, it's what prevents Mars from getting very large. It's that, it's that motion inward and back outward that prevents the accumulation of enough material to make a Mars the size of Earth, which is what it should have been otherwise. Okay, so we're starting to understand that. So today there are two sources of comets. Comets are ice, largely ice, you know, probably 50% ice, which says they don't last forever. Comet Hartley 2 is losing, on average, five meters of material everywhere on the surface, you know, from the floor to the ceiling here. That much material is being lost from the surface every five and a half years as it goes around the sun. So it's not going to last long, so you need a source for them. They're, they have not been in these orbits for the age of the solar system four and a half billion years. So there are two classical reservoirs. One is the Kuiper Belt, the classical Kuiper Belt, everything that's just beyond Neptune, including the Plutinos. And this picture is just this tiny area here. This is the Oort cloud which has of order 10 trillion comets. It was invented by Jan Oort in 1950 on the basis of the orbits of 19 comets. And an extrapolation from 19 to 10 trillion is not uncommon for astronomers. <laughs> he got it right. <laughs> Numerical models today are all within a factor of 10. Now this is a huge thing so this is 
50 astronomical units is about the edge of the classical Kuiper belt. Uh, this goes to 50,000 astronomical units. That is halfway to Alpha Centauri. Okay? That Alpha Centauri is the second nearest star, not as close as the Sun, but the nearest other one, and that goes halfway to it. Those things are just barely tied to the Sun. So we have long period comets that come in once and are gone. They have million year orbital periods. They come from the Oort cloud. Some of them get captured. Comet Halley came from the Oort cloud. Okay? We know that largely because it goes the wrong way around the Sun. It doesn't go the same way around as all the planets. Okay? And the orbits from the Oort cloud are completely randomized. <coughs> so how did these all get out here? It was the migration of the, the classical picture, when the planets were static, said that the Oort cloud came from, say, Saturn to Neptune, and the Jupiter family comets came from the classical Kuiper belt. The picture today is completely different. The classical Kuiper belt has nothing to do with comets. There is, well, if I back up one, there is out here a scattered disk, things that go out to a couple of hundred astronomical units with high inclination. And that actually is the source of the Jupiter family comets, the dominant one. Kuiper belt can contribute. People spent all sorts of time using Hubble Space Telescope, Keck telescopes, things like that, trying to find the, the comet-sized bodies in the Kuiper belt. And they showed pretty conclusively that there aren't nearly enough ob small objects in the Kuiper belt to explain the comets. Okay, so they don't, most of them don't come from there. They come from this scattered disk. That was formed in this planetary migration. Planetary migration puts some comets in the Oort cloud, some in this scattered disk, and some actually get kicked entirely out of the solar system and wander around interstellar space. And we should see one interstellar comet every 100 years, ballpark. We've never seen one yet. We could easily recognize it from the, mo from the motion. Um, this ties together the chemistry. It explains deuterium to hydrogen ratios. It explains the dynamics. It explains the ratio of water ice to dry ice that we see in different comets that come from the different reservoirs. We can recognize which comets come from which, which reservoir pretty easily. Uh, so this is a completely new view of where comets come from. Probably they all formed between 5 and 15 astronomical units from the Sun. That's between where Jupiter is now and about halfway between Saturn and Uranus. That's where they all formed, because things were a lot colder 4.5 billion years ago because of all this dust. So all these ices could condense there. Um, so this is actually a, a real revolution in our understanding of where things were four and a half billion years ago, the things that we see today. Um, <clears throat> the okay, try again. Uh, so this just describes what I just told you. So you can read very quickly, but I already told you all of it, so you don't need to read it. <laughs> um, and you know, there's, time, there's question period, so you can ask questions. Um, <clears throat> So the Jupiter family comets and the long period comets formed in the more or less in over, very largely overlapping regions. And instead of the Jupiter, formly, Jupiter family comets forming further out, they formed a little bit in closer. Um, and it explains the dynamics as well as the chemistry. Uh, and I think that is the major breakthrough that the chemistry and the dynamics both come together to explain, to, in, to give you a coherent picture. Uh, so what do we need next? Exploration of the interiors of these bodies is crucial. Whether you want it for understanding origins, for doing exploitation, or even for mitigation of the, of the impact hazard. Okay, for all of those things, you really need to understand the interiors much better than we do now. There is no coherent uh, national program to do that.
I'm done. <laughs> patience, patience. <laughs> Three, five seconds. Hold on a second. Thank you. Um, first of all, the acoustics of the room are not very good, so please when you have a question, stand and uh, speak out as loud as you can. Also, state your name and give whether you're a member of the society or not. So, okay, I'll start with the gentleman back there. Oh. Uh, yes. Sorry. I wanted to ask you. Uh, your name? Uh, my name is Jay, and uh, I wanted to ask you uh, for uh, astronauts who go out into space: is it safe for them to be on comets or asteroids? Uh, well, as long as you have an astronaut named Bruce Willis, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can cope with anything. <laughs> Uh, yes, it actually is perfectly safe. The movie with Bruce Willis is totally physically unrealistic. <laughs> the conditions are not remotely like that. Uh, there is no danger in going to an asteroid. The danger in going to a comet is very small. The biggest danger, in fact, is solar flares while you're getting there. <laughs> that's the biggest danger. And that's the one I would worry about before I'd ever go anywhere out there. <laughs> go ahead. said that you thought the dinosaur killer was uh, a comet, yep. but then you said the dinosaur killer left iridium. How would a comet have iridium? And wouldn't a comet have a hard time punching the atmosphere and how much, you know, how much mass and so forth? How, how do you square those two concepts when you, because most explanations I've heard think we're talking about an iron age meteorite. No, it's definitely not an iron meteor. Well, or, or at least a the core samples. Uh, you know, the, the the impact site was discovered by Pemex, the Mexican oil company, as part of their oil exploration. So they have lots of core samples, and because the material is down so deep, the core samples are very compressed, and they are consistent with a cometary composition or um, an asteroid meteorite of carbonaceous chondrite type. Either one, of what we would call a primitive asteroid. They're consistent with either one. Gene Shoemaker used to make the argument before he died, used to make the argument that it must have been a comet just on the size distribution arguments. Because there were lots of comets that size. There were no, hardly, there were no near Earth asteroids that size. Because you needed something bigger than 10 kilometers in diameter. Where is the iridium? Why can't a comet have iridium? I don't know, but you haven't found any in there, have you? No, but that's because we haven't done any measurement that's even remotely sensitive enough to find it. Oh, okay. <laughs> you could still get it. Yeah, right. you know, what you have to remember is that the asteroids to the comets is a continuum. Yeah. And all the refractory stuff that's in asteroids must be in comets. Uh -huh. The comets have ice added, various kinds of ices depending on how cold it was. So the iridium should still be there. Let's see, what's this idea? Oh, yes, um, uh, uh, we have a spaceship uh, Voyager who left the yes. um, solar system. I assume that in some future it will be captured by the sun and have a comet-like characteristic. My question, no, be, or, or uh, my question is, if one were to come here, would you be able to tell it instantly from any other yes. object? Yes. Uh, the orbits of bound comets are very well understood, and the Oort cloud comets are the least understood. So you, you integrate the orbit back to when it's very far from the sun. Yeah. Okay. Periodic comets you integrate back, and it closes out by Jupiter, for example. Oort cloud comets are almost parabolas. So their velocity relative to the sun when they're out in the Oort cloud is almost zero. If you think about the typical velocity of stars relative to one another in the galaxy, it's 20 kilometers per second. So any random interstellar body would be coming in on a very strongly hyperbolic orbit, far more hyperbolic than we've ever seen. We have seen hyperbolic ones. That's probably the jetting effect uh, of the outgassing. And they're only very slightly hyperbolic. So this would be so hyperbolic it would be obvious after three days of observation. Three nights. Yes, Sorry, three nights. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, John White, uh, long time member. 
Uh, just wondering, you mentioned the migration of Jupiter, and I wonder how far the Jupiter probably came, Jupiter probably came into 3AU at least, maybe into 2AU. Wow. So, so just outside the orbit of Mars. Wow. Yeah, it, it basically came into the asteroid belt. And then, uh, and then went back out again. Out again. Oh, it's, uh, it only went in once and then back out. And that whole thing took less than 100 million years, probably. Pretty quick. Pretty quick by astronomy standards. <laughs> So this is the first I've heard of planets migrating like this. Where does the gravitational potential energy come from for Jupiter to move from 2 AU uh, out to where it is now? Well, early on, it's <coughs> when this disk is around, Jupiter is moving through this disk of gas and dust, and there's a drag force. So the drag force basically causes it to spiral in slowly. Uh, once it gets, it, it comes in to where it's actually in a resonance with Saturn, and then it's the gravitational interaction with Saturn that causes it to go back out again. So can you explain resonance? Explain what? Resonance. Oh, just the, the uh, it's it's a I think in this case it, I think it's a three to two resonance. So Jupiter goes around the sun three times when Saturn goes around twice. So every three Jupiter orbits, you've got the same perturbation pulling on the orbit in the same direction because Saturn's always in the same place. So Saturn is moving in while Jupiter is moving yeah. out. Yeah, as they come in, they move into resonance. They don't start out in resonance. They're both coming in due to drag. You know, maybe Uranus and Neptune did it too, but they've only modeled you know, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Carl, I'm a member of the Institute of Astronomy, and I'm one of the lectures we had here, there was some comment about the resonance and the effect on Mercury and yep. on Mars, and that Mercury could get expelled from the solar system, as could Mars. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, I mean, in principle, all those things can happen, and it just depends on the details of what the conditions were, where the, where the giant planets were, how much drag there was, and how fast they moved around. No, but in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the future, it's less likely because the planets basically don't have these drag forces. There are, there are very few resonances anymore, except in the asteroid belt with Jupiter. And th those are actually big gaps in the asteroid belt. Um, getting a resonance between Mercury or Mars. The argument I saw I was that Mercury, because Mercury is small, that the only reason it hasn't been expelled is because of the precession. It wasn't because it's not a, nep uh, a Newtonian orbit. It, it's it's been you know it's based on the Einstein. The relativistic precession. Yes, exactly. That's a very small part of the actual precession of the orbit. Right, but that that yeah. that that's that enough to make, the resonance. Maybe I have I have not studied okay. that. I, I I won't comment any further. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm willing to get myself in trouble, but not on that one. <laughs> uh, Mike Green, a relatively new member. I have two quick questions. Sure. One, a number of years ago, I read a book by, I believe the author was named uh, Frank. And he Frank. said the oceans were filling up with water yes. due to the influx of small comets. Yep. Do you have a comment on that? And my second question was, every 300 years, supposedly, a nova goes off in the galaxy. Yes. Does this have an effect on all these comets? Yes. Uh, so the first question. Most of us think that Lou Frank is interpreting noise in the data. Hmm? Lou Frank is, sees this rain of comets in his, in his, from a satellite that's looking down on the Earth's atmosphere. Right. Right. Everyone that's, I have not looked at it closely, but I know other people who have, and they're pretty convinced that he's looking at things that are right at the noise level in the data, and he's over-interpreting, and that this rain of comets is not real. It would be very fascinating if it is real. Uh, but other people, if you, if you look at the distribution of s frequency of close approaches with size, this would be four or five orders of magnitude out of line with any reasonable extrapolation from the bigger ones that we know about. Now, it's not impossible, but it seems very unlikely. 
Um, and I think he's almost alone in thinking that this is real, or maybe some people in his group agree with him. Uh, <clears throat> I, the, even the Navy has gotten worried about this and devoted assets to it, uh, to, to looking for them and not found them. The, um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> about the uh, Novos. That oh, the Novos, yeah. The, uh, right. 100, about 300 years in each galaxy. Okay. There are two different aspects of supernovae in our galaxy that are relevant. One, the, 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 very, the frequent supernova occurrences uh, in our galaxy, there are enough of them close that the comets out in the Oort cloud, which would normally be about 10 degrees Kelvin, get warmed up to maybe 30 degrees Kelvin if there's a supernova nearby. Okay? And so that's probably happened. They have been transiently warmed to 30 or 40 degrees. How deep that penetrates, we don't know. The, the, the thermal conductivity of comets is almost zero. So the heat doesn't penetrate very effectively. So it may be only the very surface layer, maybe 10 meters. Uh, 10 meters would make the heating effect comparable to the cosmic ray or radiation. The galactic cosmic rays basically break every chemical bond in the outer 10 meters of a comet in the Oort cloud over four and a half billion years. So that's one aspect. The other aspect of the supernovae is that because we see this very clear evidence of a huge excess of the magnesium-26 isotope, it has to have come from aluminum-26. And the aluminum-26 has a half-life of tens of thousands of years. It's made in supernovae, and it's widely thought that a supernova nearby actually triggered the collapse to, to get the sun going and the disk forming, and also introduced on a longer time scale, the uh, aluminum-26 that was ejected in the supernova. And there are other, there are other extinct radioactivities, but aluminum-26 is probably the most abundant one. I guess uh, my name's Kev Buzz. I'm not a member here. I got a couple of questions. Though. What's the temperature of a comet, and what is the ambient pressure that it is in that space? The ambient pressure is zero. <laughs> Zero to anything I can measure. <laughs> I'm thinking in terms of ultra high vacuum systems, say, uh, systems that we use here, we can hit, say, 10 to the minus 10 torr. Is this several orders okay. of magnitude? Okay. In general? Suppose, you, suppose you bring a comet in to one astronomical unit, so it's outgassing a lot. Okay? You put the comet at the center of the Earth, and you, you see this big coma, which extends to the moon. Okay? If you're on the surface of the Earth, the density of that gas that's being, being evaporated rapidly is about equal to a roughing pump. Okay. <laughs> a roughing pump, a very crude vacuum pump, basically. <laughs> what you do to start the system before you put the real vacuum pumps on. <laughs> uh, so, but when it's out far from the sun, it's, the pressure is negligible compared to any vacuum system on Earth. The second question is maybe I misunderstood one of your slides, but you mentioned in order to mine a comet, you would bring it close to the Earth and probably place it in orbit and mine it close by. Uh, well, various ideas have been proposed. Okay. Bringing, mining it in situ where you find it is one, and then bringing the mined materials back. Bringing it back and putting it in Earth orbit is another one. Whether, which one you do probably depends on how big it is and how easy it is to bring it back. <laughs> Yeah, small ones you can bring back, big ones you can't. Yes, sir. That's good. Uh, Murray Little, I'm not a member. Uh, regarding this point about the mining, uh, would you envision extraction of the uh, metals to be done there or here, or how would that happen? Uh, I would envision doing it either where you find the asteroid or in Earth orbit. I would not envision it bringing it down to the surface of the Earth. Just because trying to get re-entry of the body that big is going likely to be devastating. <laughs> One argument has been made that if you were to crush the material to begin the extraction, yep. you have this enormous amount of dust that's going to be uh, not moving. Yes. 
So is, is how do you handle it? How do you handle that? Uh, I have not looked closely into the mining stuff. You know, I've been to one or two meetings about it, but I haven't looked at it closely. Um, you don't want the dust to come down on the earth because then it's night for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, it makes a, a very difficult environment for mechanical structures. Anything with moving parts is going to have a problem in a dusty environment. So you have to find a way to collect for sure, no matter what you do. Um, this Osiris Rex mission that I mentioned is going to an asteroid to bring a sample back. They've created a vacuum cleaner. They basically bring a canister of compressed air, or probably compressed nitrogen, I think it is. So they blow the stuff into, the, into a collector. So something like that is probably what you'd have to do. Thank you very much.